This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice, but to get on mandate, get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Best hour in the universe is Reasonable Doubt. I'm Adam Carolla. It's Mark Garrigus in the Hamptons. Nope, in Palm Springs in Gigi's Restaurant. Oh, sorry. Like that we stayed up all night thinking of the name. Gigi, get it? <laughs> the general manager's name is Greg Grossman. He thinks it's named after him. <laughs> I uh, I forgot. Yeah, Gary told me. I, was, I, I had a sort of resort destination in my head, but uh, I screwed the pooch. I've been driving around uh, Glendale seeing all kinds of Armo flags hanging from every lowered BMW in the in the city they uh, something about it's, the armenians uh, they like to squat they like to throw a squat on their bmw they like to, they like to cut I'm the springs and drop those <laughs> m4s down uh, the armenian right flag now. is uh, you guys could have done a better job with the flag i gotta be orange, honest red, with you blue? you don't like orange red blue uh, it's kind of like naming the restaurant Gigi's. It, you know it just made sense orange red <laughs> and you so know, they're all and, and the tricolor. A lot of solidarity with Armenia. So what's going on? Well, in Armenia, it's it's wild. Turkey and that madman Erdogan, who's kind of Hitler redux, is using Azerbaijan to attack Armenia and what's called Artsakh. And Azerbaijan Artsakh is historically for centuries been a predominantly Armenian enclave. Joseph Stalin kind of awarded it after the war um, uh, to uh, to the uh, Azerbaijani territory. Armenia took it back about 30 or 40 years ago. And now Erdogan, I think because he realizes Trump is um, uh, out, uh, is not uh, kind of engaged right now and focused on the election, has decided to use this as a way to get back um, or try to uh, attack the civilians. I was just last night, I was sent some pictures from people there of the church they destroyed in Shushi. And um, actually, um, I, I uh, contemplating right now a uh, action against Turkey and against the Azerbaijanis under the uh, uh, the foreign um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, immune, um, the, there's a, I have such a mental block on it. There is a way under the federal law that U.S. citizens can sue governments and there's no sovereign immunity. And so we've been taking a look at that because they've been doing some t- tremendous damage to civilians, bombing with cluster bombs. It's just awful. Um, well, I have a couple. The Armenian community, Sorry, go ahead. Armenian community, as you mentioned in Glendale, but it's not just Glendale, the entire diaspora. Uh, I have never seen the rally around the uh, community um, in the entire time I've been alive. This is like nothing I've ever seen. We feel like this is an existential threat. Does it fall under the heading, this potential lawsuit? I know many Americans who are survivors from 9-11 want to go after the Saudi government and the role they may have played in 9-11, which seems to be something more, a bigger role than no role. There seems to be something there. Our government is not really cooperating with the folks that would like to sue the Saudis. Uh, and I don't know where that I don't know what the I don't know where that thing is right now. But does it fall under that general heading? It's very similar. I was reading a case last night that uh, had to deal with Iran, and I don't have the case name off the top of my head. I've got it saved. Um, but the um, that case uh, when they showed the evidence, and it was compelling evidence, the judge let them take a default judgment and prove up damages in that case. And there was also a change in the law so that you could get punitive damages. This is, uh, that would seem to be the blueprint for what the Armenian community will do uh, shortly. And uh, I think it's just a matter of who is the plaintiff, so to speak. I mean, the, the obvious plaintiff to me would be the, either the uh, Armenian church who just had a, uh, the bombing done there in Shushi or some of the people, the U.S. citizens who have contributed money um, and uh, and have been injured by these civilian attacks by the terrorist organization, which is uh, the Azerbaijanis. I mean, this the the president 
fact, uh, the uh, kind of unhinged president of Azerbaijan has been making crazy, crazy statements. And then Erdogan has basically said, I'm just going to finish off the Armenians. He's going to do what the Ottomans started. How much does the uh, media or lack thereof play a role in this? So I'll just put this little thought together. You tell me what you think. Um, we've sort of discussed some of your cases, bad cop shootings, ones that just don't fit the narrative. They don't seem to get the ink and they don't seem to get the attention of the mainstream media. And thus, there's no imperative. There's no uh, obviously when you got Brianna Taylor, justice must be served or at least a check must be cut. You, you know what I mean? It's on everyone's radar. Everyone feels it. And if you're involved with that case, whatever side you're on, it, you're 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 motivated to move. Uh, when there's a Daniel Shaver type case that you have, we always talk about doesn't doesn't capture the imagination of the mainstream media. There's not much pressure to do anything. And and there's not going to be civil unrest if the wrong verdict comes out. So when it comes to um, what's going on internationally with uh, Armenians, um, you turn on CNN. CNN is reporting that Trump had a hot mic. He walked by the grave of the unknown soldier and he farted. That's essentially the top of the news all all day, every day. If CNN and the other outlets get behind the story and start pushing it out there, does that help? Does it create enough pressure or outrage? Does the president then need to react because he's being this is this is at the tip of the tongue of the American people? Well, this is what's happened. I, it was discovered yesterday that the, the Azerbaijan has spent somewhere in the, just short of $3 billion basically in a campaign in Europe to try to, to, try to swing uh, people there. Facebook determined that they'd also uh, been on a um, campaign uh, to, uh, to get into Facebook and get into Twitter and put bots and start attacking people who were trying to show, shed some light on it. So what the Armenians have done so far, Eric Israelian, who was the, um, the uh, producer, I believe, of The Promise, which was Kirk Kerkorian's um, production. Um, Eric is also a, is an activist, Armenian is a friend, and he has mobilized um, Kim Kardashian, who has started to get very active in the um, in this space, and she's obviously starting to get some kind of traction. Laura Citrakian uh, has written a couple of articles that has made, I think, the New York Times. And um, uh, Mr. Ignatius over at the Washington Post, it's starting to get some traction. It's amazing to me why this doesn't have – I mean, this is a proxy war between Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Because they're all right there. This is this is kind of ground zero for those three countries. They they did this. This was going on in Syria. It then went and happened in uh, Libya with Turkey using basically ISIS fighters, um, and because there the, Turkey is uh, views this as a way in those two countries to take out the Kurds. Now they're trying to take out the Armenians. They're trying to recreate, if you will, the Ottoman Empire. Now, mind you, why is this important to Americans? First of all, Armenia is a democracy that is landlocked, smack dab here, uh, in the first Christian nation. It is landlocked in uh, very hostile uh, Islamic states all around it, whether it's Turkey, which is the, one of the most repressive regimes, Iran, which you don't have to uh, spend a whole lot of time talking about, and Russia on the other side. Um, you would think that this was one of the most strategic areas of the world, and, that you, can, and you would think that given the kind of uh, the impact of the Armenian diaspora in America, you would think that America would be, you know, the first one to be getting involved. I mean, France has taken a very um, proactive stand, but uh, America's just been kind of asleep at the uh, the wheel so far. Well, I, you know, you turn on the news and it's all coverage about what was that fly doing on Pence's head? That's basically, that's dominating the news. You know, the, the genocide and the slaughter, that ain't making the fold. 
It's it's no, it's crazy. I, seriously, that's a, it's it's so crazy. It's so. I mean, you're watching a gen, another genocide starting. You, I can see what's happening. I mean, that people always said, why why was it been so important to get the Turks to admit they uh, committed a genocide? Precisely because that denial sets the stage for what the Turks are doing now, which is this proxy war. And Armenians sense it. We know it. We're not going to let it happen. And I've never, like I said, I've never seen the community hang together as closely as they have. And they, they view it as an existential threat. And you're absolutely right. Until we get kind of into the mainstream and we have that kind of traction, nothing's going to happen. And the U.S. could make this stop in a heartbeat on this. But the uh, the State Department is, has for years, for decades, just been held hostage by the Turks. And it's an, it's an awful situation. Well, we'll see, because as we're taping this, the Lakers are playing the championship tonight. And uh, yeah. we'll see if there's more Lakers flags on cars at the end of tonight, if they win the championship, than the Armo flag on cars. I'm guessing a lot are going to go 50-50 like I would do the shawarma plate at Zanku. Half chicken, <laughs> half beef. I think there's going to be some Lakers and some Armenian solidarity flags yeah, as no, well. I got no problem. No problem with the solidarity. Uh, you know, the I was famously... Um, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, rather disappointed in Kobe when he was a spokesperson for Turkish Airlines, but there, the, there has been a an amazing outpouring of support. You know, Alexis Ohanian, who's married to Serena Williams, has been is Armenian, has oh. been very vocal. Um, Cardi B did posted something, and um, and uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Kim has posted something as well, and all kinds of people are. Um, celebrities are using their platform, and we welcome that, obviously. Oh, uh, Alessis Ohanian's been on ACS? Oh, he's the founder of Reddit. Oh, that's probably why. Yeah. Um, all yeah. right, so shifting gears, um, I was looking, as I said, for the last, eh, for about the last three years, there's been a couple of reporters who have been on this whole FISA court and Steele dossier and that whole world. And uh, they've been right the whole time. They, they, they'd they say there's going to be some more information coming out, you know, this week. More information comes out. They kind of project what it's going to say. They basically, they basically been right all along the way. So we've talked about this a few times. Um, I'll play you. So Comey had, was uh, being questioned by uh, Ted Cruz. And uh, Ted Cruz gave him the, gave him the old stupider liar uh, angle that I like to pitch a lot. Comey is a very cool customer who's very self-assured and and seems very solid, but I I don't think he has answers for a lot of the questions that are that are coming his way. And uh, we'll we'll start it off with uh, Ted. Oh, okay, Gary needs a couple of minutes. Ted Cruz, who by the way. I just saw something, a, a clip of him on CNBC on Squawk Box um, saying basically that the election was very volatile um, and that he thinks it could break the Republican way, which I couldn't disagree with more. Or he also says what I've been saying, that this could be the biggest landslide since Jimmy Carter in 1976. I think it's setting up that way. I think it's, a, I think it's, uh, I think he's right. I think that uh, this is going to be a landslide. I know some guys tweeted at me when I mentioned that to you a couple of weeks ago, but um, I hate to say we were prescient, but the polls at least seem to be headed in that direction right now. And you couldn't have had a worse week than, uh, than they had last week. And no. this is uh, Gary got it. It's up there. Yeah, he's, he's got it. No, you're right. There's, there's only one X factor and the only X factor that is in the time we're living in now versus the time when we're talking about when the Jimmy Carter election is the media is so in the bag for Biden that you don't really know if this is a construct of the media or this is really happening. And then you get to the polls and then the polls are overwhelmingly for Biden as well. But then you have to wonder how much of the polling 
is a construct of the time we're living in, and that's the X okay. factor. And, you know, you're absolutely right about the polling. I remember, I'll go back to a previous election, when um, George Duke Duke Majin ran against Tom Bradley for governor. Right. Bradley went into election night leading across the board in all polls and obviously lost to uh, the governor. And later on, the most analysts said the reason for that is because people, there was 5 to 7% was kind of the figure that was bandied about of people who did not want to admit that they weren't going to vote for Bradley, um, you know, presumably because he was African American. But there is, there definitely is an undercurrent of people who do not want to admit that they're going to vote for Trump. And I, I have uh, friends in, and uh, people I uh, love in the uh, inner circle who are Trump supporters, but don't want to admit it. It's almost like they let their guard down and will say it to me sheepishly, but it's clear that they're going to vote for Trump, but would probably never admit it to anybody who calls you on a polling uh, phone call. All right. We have a 35 second uh, Ted Cruz clip. This is him uh, grilling or his final summation with uh, James Comey former uh, FBI director. This investigation of the president was corrupt. The FBI and the Department of Justice were politicized and weaponized. And in my opinion, there are only two possibilities. That you were deliberately cor corrupt or woefully incompetent. And I don't believe you were incompetent. This has done severe damage to the professionals and the honorable men and women at the FBI because law enforcement should not be used as a political weapon. And that is the legacy you've left. Well, there you go. You know, the as I've expressed to you on many occasions when we talk about this, the problem with this is it's a great lesson in what those of us who have practiced in the criminal justice system for many years know, which is law enforcement always, there is always a political component. The criminal justice system has been used for and weaponized for decades, for probably for a century. Um, this is not new. Uh, and the complaints that you're hearing now out of the right were exactly the complaints that the left was making 20 years ago, and exactly the complaints that those of us who defend people who are accused of crime have been doing or have been saying for virtually 50 years. The, you know, the FISA courts, for instance, I, I was screaming about FISA since while waiting for my bar exam. My father um, was defending um, Armenian freedom fighters who were the subject of FISA warrants. And I, it was astonishing to me back then, and this is in the this is 1981, 1982, when we were complaining about the fact that the FISA warrants were being, you know, basically the the government would say whatever they want. It was a what we would call a star chamber, and that all they had to do was uh, was basically make some application to some court, which is not tested in any way, shape, or form, and you're getting a one-sided view, and that shouldn't be America. And now it's just finally people, the people who would have defended it back in the 80s and the 90s are now the people who are getting hoisted on that um, same thing. So it's it's interesting to me in a, in a lot of ways because this uh, all you have to do, virtually any case, the prosecution that you see um, uh, federally that is high profile, there, you, you will find all of these kinds of shortcuts. So I tend to disagree only uh, with uh, Senator Cruz in that he doesn't go far enough. This is something that is rampant, and it's not just in political cases. It's in too many cases. Um, there's a guy named, uh, there's a senator named uh, Josh Howley from Missouri who's a young guy, but this guy's a young, he's a, he's, I almost said young Turk. He's a, he's a, he's a young pit bull. And, uh, I, he was going after Comey hard. I always, uh, know you appreciate uh, good, hard lawyering or lawyer talk. So I told Gary to whack it up. It's a little long. We'll just play some of it and you can, uh, you can respond or we can respond. I want to see this. 
Good. In this case, the FISA court said that they had reason to doubt the reliability of FBI applications across cases because of the level of misleading information that you personally signed off on. Do you regret your role in this unprecedented misleading of a FISA court? I don't regret my role. I regret that it Why not? I'm sorry? Why don't you regret your role in the unprecedented misleading of a FISA court? Well, I regret that the FBI supplied information to a FISA court that was inaccurate, incomplete, and should have been updated. Do you regret that you signed off on it? Well, I regret that it happened. The only reason I'm hesitating is what the FBI director does in connection with a FISA is actually very narrow. But put that to the side. It's important that it be accurate. And it wasn't. And I regret that very much. Let's. That's uh, Gary's first uh, salvo. Right. I'll tell you that the the. Whatever side of the political aisle you're on, I think if you're a fair-minded person, you will say that this setup, this FISA setup, for those who don't know, there are judges in what is basically a secret court, and prosecutors go to this secret court, and they get warrants, and they get warrants without any kind of um, uh, I mean, that are fairly outrageous in terms of their scope. It's a direct assault, in my opinion, on the Fourth Amendment and the founders of the, and uh, I, I think would would be appalled by this. I think this is the FISA court itself is exactly what the founders were trying to prevent by having a Fourth Amendment. And the this shows exactly what people have been complaining about for time since it's uh, since its inception but there's always and you know you can say on the right okay do you regret that now they're there the court is doubting across the board against all the cases the court should have been doing that a uh, long ago because nobody was looking at these things after the fact you can't have our adversarial system cannot be based on one side having this unfettered control that makes no sense. It's to you know, quote you, you're my favorite line of yours, it could only go one way. How else could it go if you give prosecutors unfettered power to go in secret to a judge and have no accountability for it? The only reason there was accountability here is because it was involved in the presidential election and because the president himself started to make noise about it. Other than that, this would have gone on for a time immemorial. Uh, We have a couple more clips of uh, Josh uh, Howley from Missouri, Senator, uh, on Comey. Here we go. Talk about what personal knowledge you have. When you certified the first Carter Page FISA application, you believed that Mr. Steele was working for the Democratic Party, didn't you? I don't remember whether I knew the Democratic Party. I knew that he was working for political opponents of President Trump. Now, let me remind you of your testimony under oath on December 7th, 2018, before the House Oversight Committee, in which you said, and I quote, Steele was retained by Republicans adverse to Mr. Trump during the primary season, and then his work was underwritten after that by Democrats opposed to Mr. Trump during the general election season, end quote. Now, surely you recognized at the time that relying so heavily on a biased source would undermine public confidence in the FBI's activities, didn't you? No, I did not. Why wouldn't you? You told the same committee, the House Oversight Committee, December 7, 2018, and I quote, when you're the leader of a justice agency, that's you, the appearance of bias is as important as the existence of actual bias. You also said a reasonable appearance of bias can corrupt the American people's faith in your work as much as actual bias can. Do you stand by those remarks? Very much so. But you nevertheless allowed the Democratic Party to leverage the federal government's most invasive intelligence capabilities against President Trump, and you personally signed off on it. You also knew at the time that other officials in the Department of Justice had serious concerns. Do you know who Stuart Evans is? I do. Mr. Evans was a lawyer in the National Security Division of DOJ under President Obama, wasn't he? I think he was, I don't know for sure. I think he was a career official at the Department of Justice involved. He was a lawyer in the National Security Division of the Department of Justice. Before the first Carter Page FISA application, Mr. Evans raised serious concerns about the ostensibly partisan nature of the information provided by Mr. Steele. Did he not? I don't know. 
that he did. The inspector general reports it on pages 136 and 137 of this report. And you knew of those concerns before you signed off on the FISA application, didn't you? I don't think I knew before. I remember reading the footnote that attempted to inform the court of potential bias. No, actually, the, the inspector general found on page 139 of the report, and I quote, on October 12, 2016, Evans' concerns about Steele were briefed to Comey, end quote. Well, there you go. That guy, Josh uh, that's, a, that's somebody. What's, what is Josh's background? Must have been a, must have been a former prosecutor. I, it's funny, or rear admiral, but he he has a <laughs> he also has a voice for radio. So he has this sort of deep whatever. He's a young guy, but he has this sort he of deep old voice. A, he needs a, a collar stay. I hate to be so petty, but nothing irritates me more than when the collar of your shirt when you're wearing a suit is pointing up in that direction. It's a very bad fashion faux pas. But I'm going to give him some kudos. I don't know what his background is, but he's obviously somebody who's been in a courtroom, at least it appears. Uh, By the way, great minds think alike because uh, Gary was thrown way off his game by the collar being popped up as well. And was having having difficulty with it. The chief of staff for Senator Howley, You'd be taken out to the woodshed for that. That's a that is a faux pas when you're trying to get your boss and when your boss is doing a good job and is surgically filleting uh, Comey, who, by the way, could he have been more ill prepared? I, I don't understand what the what the deal was. Mind you, this is a guy who has now managed to piss off the left, piss off the right, and uh, is uniformly um, regarded as interfering with the election on both in both ways. So it's a, it's an astonishing feat for somebody, for one guy to accomplish. Uh, you have his ba- Howley's background? Yes, I do. And yes, his, not only his chief of staff, but his whole staff should be filleted for not pointing out his collar. <laughs> he, uh, he, after getting a Bachelor of Arts from Stanford, he went to Yale Law School, uh, he clerked for Judge McConnell in the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit and Chief Justice John Roberts. He then went on to become the 42nd Missouri Attorney General before uh, defeating a Democratic incumbent to become U.S. the youngest U.S. senator currently at age 40. That guy's a well, sharp he's, cookie. So he doesn't, Jim. He's sharp, and, and uh, I'm surprised that there isn't any courtroom um, – actually doing it in a courtroom but he's definitely got the chops for it i mean the uh, that was a very good cross-examination he was prepared to his to staff's credit even though they don't know collars stay uh, when it belongs in they at least knew to give him the right pages out of the ig's uh, report just uh, because mark's radar is going off i was going for mostly the greatest hits he did work as an appellate litigator as well so he was spending some time in a courtroom in between those those clerkships and uh, going into uh, politics. Well, Mark knows. We have uh, a couple more clips of uh, Howley. Uh, yeah, going I, I, this is fascinating to me. I, like I will. It, the thing, I, I'll tell you what I've noticed, and this may be a Comey thing. I've noticed it oftentimes. Uh, Kamala Harris had it a little bit with Pence. I've noticed it a little with folks that are on the left, they're, they live, for the most part, in a sort of zero-gravity world. They don't, they don't really, people don't disagree with them that much. They don't debate that much. They don't get that much pushback in, in most of the environments. They go on to CNN. CNN blows sunshine up their ass. And they don't really have those muscles. So what it is is Ted Cruz is fighting with someone every single day. You know, a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys, if you take these guys like Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager or Larry Elder or or Ted Cruz, the conservative guys, they're constantly debating, arguing and making their point against basically society. You know, they're pushing back against society. And that's why I think there's a little bit of a history, modern day history of when some of these people who are left-leaning, get into an environment where people are asking pointed questions. They don't really have the muscle to push back. They're not really used to it. It kind of uh, reminds me, if you ever 
find a guy, and this is this happened to me has happened to me a few times in in my career. If you ever find a guy who is a big muckety muck and he runs, you know, this talent agency and he's been the toast of the town for forty years, and you tell that guy to fuck off, he's it's not he doesn't he's confused. I've told I've had this happen. It happened at a Dodger uh, celebrity All Star game. You tell someone who hasn't been told to fuck off for 35 years to fuck off, and th- they're not even, they don't know what to do with it. They're so used to people kissing their ass. They don't really have the muscle memory of, of, of being able to push back. And I do, I have found that oftentimes you can watch people on the internet debate Ben Shapiro. They're not ready for him. Like they don't. They don't have answers. They just they're so used to kind of moving through so, you know, these debates. So, yes. This is so interesting because I was telling a buddy of mine who I had lunch with in New York, who's also a trial lawyer, probably one of the best um, uh, employment rights trial lawyers there is. And he had watched. I think we we had lunch the day after the Trump Biden debate and. He was very, I mean, he's obviously, as most trial lawyers are, probably pro-Biden. But he was concerned that, I won't mention his name, he probably wouldn't want me to, but but I'm a big fan. Um, He was concerned that Trump had cleaned Biden's clock. And I said, you know, I've got the opposite opinion. Let me tell you why. I, I, early on in my career, I used to have those um, cable news food fights, and I with, with I always used to call them the bleach blonde former prosecutors, former federal prosecutors, with Nancy Grace, Barbara Olson, rest in peace, um, and a series of those women. And I, I, I found something that was very interesting. When you start talking over them or you start kind of getting into the mud with them, um, it you don't come off as well. It was like my own focus group. I would get – hate mail. I would get emails or whatever it was. But if you just kind of smiled and and responded and you did it in a way that was more like what you would do in a courtroom, you know, you're not going to act like a, a village idiot in a courtroom. Generally, I try not to, um, although I've made that mistake. But <laughs> I think it the way people view it, and especially the way people who are not partisan. So look, if the debate is about moving that 7% of people who are going to determine the election, my expectation was, and I told my friend this, I said, I think you're going to find that people are going to say that Biden won the debate. And sure enough, that happened. Same thing when I was watching um, Kamala and um, and vice president this week in Salt Lake City. I was there that night and um, the, you know, the hotel was a buzz afterwards uh, in the post debate party, but people were st- saying how she had won um, because, or that there was that, that smiling in the way people don't like that, except if you're in that camp um, and people don't like the, the kind of the, that 7%, if you will, um, are not fans of Mike Pence rolling over somebody or talking into their time. So it depends on who your audience is. And your point, long way of getting to your point, your point is if you're not used to doing that, it's a skill set. And you don't get that skill set. It's not an innate skill set. It's it's learned. It's learned either in a courtroom. It's learned um, doing these kinds of panels and cable news that you have to understand that you're, there is there's a kind of a level of um, being able to talk on your feet, argue on your feet, and make the um, arguments. I'll tell you who I watched this morning do it amazingly, um, so that uh, the people on the the uh, left can see. Maybe Gary can find it. I watched Pete Buttigieg do um, two interviews. Maybe it was the same, but one was with Ducci from. Uh, Fox and Friends. The other was, I think, with Brett Baer. He did about as perfect a interview and on, and talking on his feet. I mean, it's almost a primer. I would like to show it to my young lawyers to say, this is a great way. In fact, Gary, if you're looking for it, he talked to them. They were asking him about Medicare for all. And he talked about his response was, that's a parlor game. And he did it very effortlessly. I was very impressed by what he did. And the same kind of talent that you get. 
I'll have Gary uh, look for that. Uh, I got a old Newsome clip from when he was here in studio that I just think uh, Mark would enjoy hearing. Uh, we have some more with Josh Hadley as well. Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City. Your Newsome clip about the moving to Utah that we did last mm-hmm. week. I don't know if it was, I don't remember if it was ACS or RD or both. Boy, did that resonate. I mean, people, uh, I can't tell you the number of people who have uh, brought that up to me. I was on Tucker Carlson last night and he got a big laugh because uh, he was, you know, I'll, I'll give you a little peek behind the creative curtain in a second. First, let me tell you about Tommy John. Always push yourself. That's what I say. I got a freezing cold swimming pool. I jump into it every winter morning just to push myself, but not when it comes to what's in your pants. That's where you need comfort. That's Tommy John. Start every morning with Tommy John and uh, you'll be that much more comfortable, that much more better off. I'm wearing uh, mine right now, as I always do. Breathable, lightweight, moisture wicking by the way, four times the stretch of uh, competing brands moves with you. Um, they're really, it's a way of life. Once you go with Tommy John, they don't have customers. They have converts. Once you get into the Tommy John, you never get out of the Tommy John. And that's where I am right now. 96% four-star plus reviews and over 12 million pairs sold. It's the best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free, guarantee, right, Gary? That's absolutely right. Get that much more comfortable at TommyJohn.com slash RD and save 15% on your first order. Save 15% right now at TommyJohn.com slash RD. TommyJohn.com slash RD. I do have Mark's clip, so you can add that to your list, and we'll go in whatever order you like. All right, so I get the call, you know, late in the afternoon yesterday. Like, Tucker wants you to come on and talk about the uh, fly landing on Pence's head. You know, and and I've I've you know you hear the jokes, yeah, the flight's attracted to shit, and and blah blah blah. So um, I'm trying to figure out uh, some angles, and I I don't want to go the stuff that that the the roads that everyone else went down. Not that interested. Plus, I know Tucker's not going to be amused at uh, fly landing on poop. You know, kind of joke since he's probably more in the Pence camp than he is in the Kamala Harris camp. So I'm trying to think of these angles, and I know one. He used to live in California, and he left, and and right. and I've seen his show enough to know he frequently does segments on like what's happened to California. So I know that that's kind of his propensity. I know that's that's a spot that he likes to talk about, you know. And when you when you know people, you know. That, uh, you know, you're talking to Mark Garagos, you can either bash the Turks or talk uh, Don Julio, you know, and and when you're, <laughs> and I got other guys I talk to about cars, you know, but so I'll have you know that you're. I'll have you know that your wife just tweeted at me that I got her hooked on Don Julio after our trial win, and uh, <laughs> she's never been the same. Lynette just uh, just tweeted at me. So I I knew I know what Tucker likes. So he said, uh, and and what about the fly? You know what what's the story with the fly? Do you think it's as they said on MSNBC, the mark of the devil? I said no. The fly was. Uh, just uh, disoriented because the fly had fled California. He couldn't take it <laughs> anymore. He couldn't take Newsom anymore. So he actually left and he'd been flying all night. He, he didn't, he was disoriented. And uh, of course, Tucker loved it because it fit right in with the theme. And it was a, an angle that other people weren't, weren't picking. So if you're looking for a sort of comedic angle, don't pick one that everyone that's has a, already that's a, uh, waxed right. on. One of, the, one of the things I love about you is that you always go down the path less traveled. Did um, did you then build on that with the segment with uh, Tucker? Did you the jokes, maybe uh, some here were, compelling argument? Here were my jokes. Uh, my jokes were if the fly landed on Biden, it would have taken him down. Because uh, Biden could not withstand the weight of a house fly at this point. If the fly had landed on Kamala Harris, uh, CNN would have called it a hate crime. And if the fly had landed on Nancy Pelosi, it would have simply 
crawled in one ear and walked out of the other completely unscathed. And uh, of course, you know, of course, his audience is going to like all that shit. You got to figure who's oh, who's, who's, exactly. who's watching. You're, you're, ampl- you're amplifying, man. You're amplifying. And and Tucker was laughing because he was like, California's gotten so bad that the insects, dung beetles, don't want to live there <laughs> a- 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 anymore. Uh, all right. So, Gary, do you have a Buddha judge? And then we'll get back to uh, we got some newsome and we got some Howley as well. Here's uh, here's him on Fox. Here we go. Back to my original question about the things that, you know, when you run for president, you have a record on all of these issues. And then we've seen that record and her stance on them changing over time. So there's no doubt she's going to be asked about that tonight. Can you give us some insight into what she might say to justify why she was for Medicare for all then and is not for it now, for example? Well, there's a classic parlor game of trying to find a little bit of daylight between running mates. And if people want to play that game, we could look into why a, an evangelical Christian like uh, Mike Pence wants to be on a ticket with a president caught with a porn star or how he feels about the uh, uh, immigration policy that he called unconstitutional before he decided to team up with Donald Trump. If folks want to play that game, we, we could do it all night. But uh, I think what most Americans want to hear about is are our families going to be better protected than they have been by this president who's failed to secure America in the face of one of the most dangerous things ever to happen to our country. Will yeah, right. it, was, it was skillful, question. non a non answer, but skillful. <laughs> it's a total non answer, but you know that's I you know that's the whole idea of rhetoric, the classical definition of rhetoric, which is kind of the art of persuasion or the art of, uh, of uh, oral. Um, uh, uh, kind of talking and, and argument is to be able to kind of pivot and parry, pivot and parry. And he did a masterful job of jujitsu, of uh, rhetorical jujitsu there, to the point where I don't think, I think Brett Bear looked like somebody had cattle prodded him after. <laughs> didn't know where to go. Uh, I'll play you uh, the rest of what uh, Gary put together with the uh, Senator uh, Howley from Missouri. And uh, yeah, the guy, the guy seems to have chops all right here we go sir let's talk about what else you knew or didn't know when you certified that fisa application did you know the allegations in the Steele dossier came from subsources not from Steele's own knowledge i believe i did know he had a network of sources and subsources correct did you know who this primary subsource was no did you ask who the primary subsource was no did you ask the FBI to take any steps to identify that source before submitting this application to the FISA court? I don't know whether I asked. I knew there was an effort underway to try to replicate Steele's source network so we could figure out what to make of Steele's reporting. Well, what the, uh, ter- what the inspector general concluded was that Comey told us, this is page 153, that the application seemed factually and legally sufficient when he read it, and he had no questions or concerns before he signed it. Surely you realize that the source's identity and his motives, this subsource, who we now know may well have been a Russian agent, that that would affect his credibility, correct? I thought it was important that we were informing the court of any potential bias from any source. And I remember reading language in this, in that initial filing that addressed that potential bias issue with respect to the Steele reporting. It, so you're, you're, I'm sorry, your testimony now is that you inform the court of potential problems with the subsource, uh, political motivations, uh, connections to foreign governments. The FISA court was informed about that? No, I'm sorry. I understood your question to be about whether we informed the court about potential bias in Steele's reporting. I didn't know the identity or any information about subsources. So you personally authorized on an unprecedented surveillance on an individual associated with the presidential campaign during that campaign's ongoing time period, October of 2016, you signed off personally on two further applications based on information from a source that you believed correctly worked for the Democratic Party, and the source's information, it turns out, was coming from a suspected Russian agent, yet you did nothing to try to verify any of this information. You brushed aside the concerns of high-level national security lawyers at the Department of Justice, How are the American people to trust you or the FBI following abuses like this? I 
disagree with, extensively with your predicate. I think the FBI is an organization that is honest, competent, independent, and also flawed because it's made up of human beings. Well, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not necessarily worried about the FBI as a whole. I'm worried about you. And I'm worried about what you certified to a court <laughs> that led the FISA court to conclude that it had been misled repeatedly and that due to the nature of that, those repeated misrepresentations, it could no longer trust what the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the agency, you led, what it said in subsequent cases. That, I suggest to you, is an incredible dereliction of duty, indeed a betrayal of your responsibility as director of the FBI. On the, the letter. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, had, he had me until it was objection argumentative. You know, what's fascinating about that hmm. is what he has talked about. When you hear him talk about a subsource, what he's talking about is that Steele, who was the person who was giving the information, was relaying hearsay information, meaning some other person, they call it a subsource. Uh, in traditional warrants, you would probably call it a informant or a confidential informant. Sometimes they call them confidential, reliable informants. Basically what it is, it's the cop telling a judge, or in this case, judges, that I've got this information. I'm not going to tell you who the information is from, but it's confidential information. Usually this all started in the, in the war on drugs, um, frankly, and they would always say, uh, we're not going to tell you who it is because we're afraid this person's uh, for this person's safety, and that's why they're an informant. And this is what the informant told us, and therefore give us a warrant so we can go do this. It exactly the corruption um, that that leads to from the war on drugs is where we are right now with people feeling like they can go seek warrants with impunity. That's I mean, you watched Comey right there. He basically feels like there is a air of impunity to, you know, the FBI is this exalted institution and it's fine. And Howley, to his credit, is saying, what are you talking about? You got the judges so pissed off. And it's a panel of judges. It's not just one. The FISA court is a panel. And they got so upset over what the Horowitz found as the IG the inspector general, that they said they they basically uh, had trouble believing anything the FBI brought to them. And that's a monumental kind of rebuke by a judicial panel. By, I mean, you're saying basically we, we can't trust anything that you're telling us. And by the way, it's only this only happens when they get caught red handed. I mean, this happened. By the way, there was a judge, I believe it was Judge Nathan in the Southern District, who excoriated the Department of Justice in an opinion and required that opinion to be read by every U.S. attorney or deputy. Um, so it's, you know, this would appear to be um, as widespread as those of us who have been on the receiving end and defending end of clients have maintained for 40 years. Do you think there's any exposure for Comey or John Brennan or Page or Strzok? Do you think there's going to I, end up yeah, anywhere? I think as long as Bill Barr and Chris Christie are uh, alive and well, I hmm. think that there is exposure before the election. I think that they have – I think there is – There's. you know, it's like looking at breadcrumbs on the ground and trying to figure it out. But there was a uh, – the, either the chief assistant or somebody who was close to Durham resigned because of the pressure, I believe it was a she, that she mm -hmm. felt to bring something before the election. I think that you can see by the plea that was uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I don't think for a second that it's going to wait until after the election. In fact, I think the DOJ is going to suspend their own policy which has been done before, by the way. This wouldn't be the first time. But to suspend their own policy to not bring a politically sensitive um, indictment right before the election, I think they are. And I think I don't I, I don't want to speculate as to who, but I believe that there's going to be a uh, October surprise. I think that um, the president telegraphed that yesterday also in that Maria 
Bartoloma uh, interview where he said that Barr is either going to go down in history or is going to be a sad uh, example, basically putting more pressure on it. We've seen what happens when the pressure is brought. We saw, we see what happens with Flynn and everything else. I think that uh, we're going to probably have a breaking news RD episode sometime between <laughs> now and the election when, when one of these indictments gets unsealed. Well, I hope I'm at a private airport this time and not waiting on a Southwest <laughs> flight. Um, with Gary trying to find you and as, uh, as you're going through the gates. Uh, the um, last but not least, uh, or almost last but not least. So I am infatuated really with uh, Gavin Newsom because from a intellectual standpoint, his ability to not answer questions is is staggering. It is staggering. And, you know, we were making fun of him last week when he was being interviewed and somebody was asking him about uh, leaving California. And his his answer was inane and, and insane. But he had, the beginning part of his answer was equally as insane because the person interviewing him said a lot of people are thinking about leaving California. And then he said, well, it's like former uh, Governor Jerry Brown would say, where the hell else you're going to go? And then the person said, well, yeah, but anywhere people are leaving. And he went, yeah, I know. That's just what Brown was saying. I don't know. It's like, okay, so you don't agree with what Brown, by the way, you shouldn't quote people you, you disagree with. But okay, he sort of throws. And he also, by the he also, by the way, mentioned if I if my recollection is correct that um, that the uh, person was a good friend of his, and some good friend of the his, good friend of his, up moving to Utah. The good friend of his just picked up and went to Utah with the fly, and yeah. and also he he <laughs> mumbled at the very end. He kind of mumbled like, "Yeah, I th- th- think they'll be back." You know, it's like, why would they come back? Okay, but anyway, there's that. But it reminded me when he was in here, I have an obsession, and my obsession isn't traffic. My obsession is we live in a state, and in that state is a city, Los Angeles, that has the worst traffic in the world, and it never comes up as a subject of things to discuss. We discuss, you know, homelessness ad nauseum and we discuss, uh, you know, the school to prison pipeline and we discuss, you know, no child being left behind. We have a million discussions about the environment and third hand smoke. We never discuss traffic and what we could do about it. So, of course, when I got Lieutenant Governor at the time, Gavin Newsom in here, I I obsess and, and I'll. I'll We'll play the clip, but but listen for his answer about what we could do to alleviate this uh, scourge known as traffic. Here's his answer. And huh. lo- and California, with some of the worst traffic in the world, doesn't have a policy that Idaho thought of. Is that right? This can't be the first time you've heard this. Well, not specifically this. I, I just I saw a billboard out on the 405 says you're not stuck in traffic. And you're thinking, how the hell what does that mean? It says you are traffic. Which I kind of like. <laughs> That's a problem solver right there, people. <laughs> You're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. I kind of like it. He, which he kind of likes. Has he, ever, has he ever appeared on your show after that? No. It's never going to appear after. Have you ever after. tried? No. I mean, yes. He's never coming. He's not coming back on. It was, it was 55 minutes of me grilling him. He couldn't go anywhere. Um yeah, that's right. Kalen asked him in person, and he said, uh, I needed to apologize to the uh, Latino community before he would come on. All right, I apologize to the Latino community. Now come back on, you pussy. He's never coming back on. He's, he's got, he got destroyed. I destroyed him because he couldn't leave. Um, what I was saying, people send me pictures from Idaho And in Idaho, they have signs by the side of the highway that says, if it steers, it clears. If you get into a fender bender, pull it off. L.A., I see people in the third lane of the freeway standing outside their cars after a light fender bender. Like, this is the plastic fender on their Prius is scuffed by the car behind it. 
both cars are perfectly drivable and people are standing outside of their car on the freeway exchanging information and they should be told pull over get off of the freeway get onto the shoulder pull down the ramp exchange all your information there but they don't know they think I'm in the I'm in the third lane. You rear-ended me at eight miles an hour. I have to stop and get out of my car and walk around and talk to you in the middle of the fucking freeway. Every other state and by the way, how has many this. People, how many people have been killed oh by, my... by that? I've I've personally known two people who've been killed on the side of the freeway by, by doing that. It's it's just it's just awful, you know. And they used to have, and it doesn't seem to work anymore. Um, they used to have kind of a um, uh, tow truck rapid response team that used mm-hmm. to go do that. And I always wondered, well, why are we? Why do we need a tow truck rapid response team when it's precisely the problem you're talking about? You could drive it off. But oh, my God. It's like this idea that you can't drive off the freeway. I, I will tell you, well, first off, you know from watching – the high speed pursuits when the tires are shot out and the car's overheating and one of the rims is running on bare rim. There's no more tire anymore. There's sparks coming out. The guy's still driving that fucking Celica at 80 miles an hour down the freeway with sparks. I mean, you have no idea what these cars are capable of. When I, I've done the Toyota Celebrity Grand Prix of Long Beach five times. People get into horrific accidents in those cars, and they still just drive along. Like, you can still finish and pull into the pit lane. I mean— Well, especially L.A., there's an off-ramp every, what, quarter mile, half right. a mile? I mean, is it, I mean, you're talking about four football fields. You don't think a car that's going at 60 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour can't get that period of, uh, that period of ground? I mean, it's—you it's, you almost have to— um, work against the natural order to stay on the freeway when you've had some kind of a fender. Bend. Right. And so my feeling is it's incredibly dangerous to get out of your car in the middle of the freeway. It's also incredibly dangerous to get out of your car on the shoulder of the freeway, as your friends found out the hard way. Yeah. There should be a campaign on all of those electronic freeway signs that basically just says you get into a fender bender pull it off the freeway. Just pull it off. The highway patrol, when they're pulling people over, get on the squawk box and tell you to pull off. They don't want to get out of the car on the freeway either. It's it's a simple public awareness campaign. It'd be very simple to do. You just heat it up. Instead of click it or ticket on those freeway signs, you just put, if it steers, it clears, pull over, pull off in case of an accident. That's it. If your car's running, pull off. Right. I mean, and don't tell me it's too tough to do. I, I've never bought that. I, but the point is, is Gavin Newsom liked the part where you weren't in traffic. You were traffic. He liked that. He kind of liked it. Well, he chuckled. It's the, your, your bet noir is uh, Gavin. Mine is uh, uh, his honor, uh, Mr. Garcetti. I have come to the conclusion that they just want to make downtown LA so congested, so ridiculous that nobody will come there. I mean, that's my, he's put bike lanes on Figueroa um, as if people are riding bikes in downtown LA. I mean, you know, it's a, the, the uh, we have more of those, you know, those city bikes as if all kinds of people are grabbing bikes to ride bikes in downtown LA. They're, they want to, their whole idea is we're just going to make it impossible. And right. I don't know, to quote you, I don't know what the end game is. I don't understand it. Uh, they want to be Holland or there's something. There's some sort of European city from the mid 50s that they there's a picture that they have in their head of like healthy, thin people riding bicycles everywhere. While you know, you, you, you hear the sound of, of the accordion playing in the distance and that's sort of their world. They have this world view of like, we should be more like these people. And I will try to graft that onto this environment, but it's impossible. Nobody wants it. And there's some sort of 
sort of utopian, Orwellian kind of thing that they have that just never pans out, and it's it's not mathematically viable. But that's well, what I'd the, like they to see. Want. I'd like to see him come downtown without his security detail, with no security whatsoever, and just walk around. Just come down and walk around. And it wouldn't take more than 30 minutes for any right-thinking, common-sense person to say, I have created an outdoor insane asylum. And, and they, it's just they, they, they live in a bubble. They do not have to walk or work absent having a protective bubble around them to understand the dimension and the, uh, the, the absolute ridiculous nature of this. How they think anybody can conduct business in downtown L.A., you, first of all, you would have to, you, you have to want to put young or females into danger at all times. I mean, we've got, Gary's seen them. I've got tapes of the various females who work in my downtown L.A. office being assaulted running down the street as as uh, people who are obviously mentally unstable are throwing things at them. There was a guy this uh, last week with a machete running around. I mean, you think nothing of it. Man with machete on 7th and Fig. I mean, it's insanity. I, uh, I concur. All right, let me uh, hit our last sponsor here, Madison Reed. Now, this is Madison Reed Misser. So Madison Reed has been making fine hair coloring products for women for quite some time. Lynette uses their product, and now they went, well, what about the fellas? Thus, Madison Reed Mister was born. You can get rid of uh, that gray. It blends it naturally. Uh, It'll work for your hair. It'll work for your beard. You can see the before and after shots. They look great. No shoe polish look. A little more pepper and a little less salt. Madison Reed Mister makes it easy to find the color. Match it on the website. Quick and easy. Just apply the color gel. They give you gloves. It's a little kit. They'll give you the gloves. You put the dollop of the gel in, work it through your hair, and then you do the uh, activator. Shampoo it with their special shampoo. And Bob's your uncle. You're done. Madison Reed Mister. Right, Gary? That's right. Go to MadisonReedMister.com. That's M-A-D-I-S-O-N-R-E-E-D-M-R. And use code ADAM10 for 10% off plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code ADAM10. Well, good news. Me and Mark Garagos up on stage for live Reasonable Doubt. That'll be November 21st, West Palm Beach Improv. So come on out and uh, watch uh, Mark in, uh, in the flesh. Also, and myself, we'll have a good time up there. I'm doing stand-up on the 24th of October at the Lafayette Cajun Dome. We're going to do a live pod, and then I'll do stand-up second show. Drew is zooming in for the uh, live pod, and it'll be out in the parking lot. We're going to kind of tailgate it out there. Also, back to West Palm Beach, November 20th and 21st, we'll be doing, uh, I'll be doing stand-up and live pods there as well. So just go to adamcrolla.com for all the information you need. Mark, what do you got? We still have uh, Capri in Southampton still open. Uh, Naya, the restaurant, uh, pop in there. Uh, v Palm Springs uh, by Sonder. We just uh, uh, instituted that on the first. We're down here. Come by Gigi's for a great meal. And uh, Casa Tropicana San Clemente, one of Gary's favorite spots. Um, open. Stop by there as well. And if you're in downtown L.A., bring your machete and do a little fencing and come by Engine Company 28 or 10E for Mediterranean Tapas. So, until next time, Adam Kroll for Mark Garriga saying mahalo. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode.